Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 674. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's July 16th, 2021. All right, welcome to the Casual Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, where you sit down with Kevin and George, and we talk about the world of Anglican news. And we have a new policy, which we'll talk about in a second. Before we get too far into the show, please like us on Facebook and YouTube. It's kind of weird that I have to do this, but it's free advertising for us. If you have not shared this program with your friends and foe in a while, please do so, because that's free advertising as well. Please subscribe to the show if you're not subscribed. And boy, we got lots of comments last week. Keep them coming. The show continues in the comment section. George, how you been doing this week? I feel great, excited. We've we've got a shot clinic at church this morning, uh, COVID and hepatitis A. And I'm a little frightened about uh, Big Brother because I went and signed up to get a hepatitis A shot for myself and my wife. And uh, we're in line and I turn in my form and the health nurse uh, pulls up her computer and says, well, Father, you've had your hepatitis A shots in 2007, but Mrs. Conger has it. And I'm thinking, how do they know? Thank this God is the know. county health department. <laughs> in 2007, I was not in this county. How do they know I had hepatitis shots? I can't remember having hepatitis <laughs> shots. That's so why Big Brother is watching me. <laughs> no, and I mean, you don't want to get three rabies shots. I mean, you, you kind of want a little bit of oversight. And that's what they have to offer when they have free, you know, uh, shot sites that you want them to know that you've had previous shots because I don't remember what I had. You know, Kevin, my doctor would say, is it time for your booster? Let's look it up on the computer. Oh, you do need your tetanus booster. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you for knowing because I don't know. Oh, well, boy. we we are having, the, the health nurse is telling us our county is having a hepatitis A outbreak among the homeless and the illegal immigrant population. Mm -hmm. Uh, And many of them get jobs in restaurants as dishwashers and things like that. And that's how it gets spread into the uh, bourgeois population. I don't know how to describe it. So if friends may, you may want to get a hepatitis A shot in these difficult times. Sure, but it's cool that they're getting jobs. And you know, it's it's a great way to become unemployed. It's a it's a solution to unemployment. Uh, well, it, it's a fascinating in that you know there are signs. There's a Wendy. We we now have a Wendy's in our town. That was the big news about three years ago. We now have two fast food restaurants, huh? and they have signs starting at eighteen dollars an hour. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Wendy's! I know. I was we went to Pizza Hut last night. It's the only pizza they offer in Pennsylvania. Sorry, not very good. Not very many good pizza restaurants in our area. And I'm talking to the manager, and he does not have a driver. He does not have a cook. He does not have any other staff except himself in this. And I said, well, what do you offer for a starting wage here? Well, Pizza Hut in Pennsylvania offers $9 an hour. And I said, well, there's part of your problem, because Amazon uh, over in Washington, Pennsylvania, is paying $15 an hour starting salary. So you're going to have a little bit of trouble hiring people. Uh, because the competitive wage is a little higher for even the starting salary. But even worse, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania still offers federal unemployment. So people can stay home and they're making $13 an hour. They recently did a study saying, at what rate will people finally go back to work? I can sit at home on the couch for $13 an hour. It would take at least $17 an hour to get me motivated to get off the couch and actually have to work. So we haven't hit that sway yet, you know. Well, Governor DeSantis uh, in Florida has uh, rejected those federal funds, Mm -hmm. forcing, I don't want to say forcing, but motivating people to get off the couch and go to work. And because of that, all of a sudden we have signs everywhere, Uh, DoorDash, you know, door all the all the restaurants, uh, uh, DoorDash delivery services, the the casual labor, uh, which disappeared. Now everybody needs those bodies again. Yeah, they do. I mean, if the economy is going to require, if the economy is going to recover without inflation or mass inflation, we need people to go to back to work, and uh, you know they will be paying they will be paid a higher wage than pre COVID because of the government's intervention. But hey, I we're not here just to talk politics. I mentioned we're going to have a new rule. 
We've done 674 episodes of Anglican Unscripted. Of that, the vast majority has not been considered good news. And so the first story of every week from now on, 674 on, is going to be good news. We will find it somewhere if we have to. Even if it's the end times and the apocalypse and there's a comet hitting the earth, we will find a good story in there somewhere. George, what is this week's good news story? Well, the Jerusalem Post had a fascinating article. The Israeli Antiquities Department unearthed some pot pottery shards and uh, that told a bit of a story. And if you turn to the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 11, you'll read, Now the call of the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak of Oprah, which belonged to Joash the, Ad the Beziite, as his son Gideon was beating out the wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. We now have archaeological proof that there was a judge in Israel called Gideon. They found inscriptions to that effect. They used the name Zerubbaal, which is the Gideon's other name. Mm -hmm. But one of the fascinating things about biblical archaeology, you know, in the early 20th century, the thing was from the German and uh, higher critical scholars was that the Bible's all a myth. These are all stories made up. There's no basis in truth. There never was a Moses. There never was a David. There never was a Solomon. Friends, all of that is being... Now, we don't have archaeological evidence for Moses yet, but David and Solomon... Gideon. These things are just popping out of the ground. It's so exciting to me for the historicity. Uh, now, it cannot prove the miracles and the battles of Gideon, no. but this but, guy was real. But nothing has been disproven out of Scripture, which, yes. is, which is awesome. Um, and I get, you know, one of my favorite things is always to discover things, you know, and it's always the the weird things, stuff that is just kind of a barely a mention of the Bible. You know, that's where the archaeologists dig up. Oh, by the way, that kind of city at the end of Ezekiel, it's here. It's like, what? It's so crazy. You know, so, you know, it is what it is. So that's the good news story for this week of episode 674. Let's move Now on. we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven bad news stories to even it out. No, George, our second story is also a good news story. Oh, what is this? Bishop of Winchester is good. Yes, you're right, Kevin. <laughs> you're right. Fill us in. This morning, July 16th, the Bishop of Winchester, Tim Dakin, published his letter of retirement at the age of 62 from being Bishop of Winchester. Now, we've reported extensively on the turmoil in the Diocese of Winchester, where the diocese leaders essentially said we're going to give you a vote of no confidence you've got to go because of your horrid personality your terrible management techniques you've run the diocese into the ground financially all list of all these bona fide ills we've reported when gavin uh, ashenden was with us he was a priest in jersey under the bishop of winchester and the bishop of winchester single-handedly managed to alienate Jersey and Guernsey, moving them from the, the Diocese of Winchester, things were so bad, uh, to the Diocese of, uh, was it Salisbury? I don't know. But he moved them out like just because he's such a poor bishop. With very, uh, I would call it poor grace, Tim Dakin announced his retirement. He's out. And he basically said, oh, well, you know, it's been a wonderful 10 years as bishop, but Last 18 months with COVID, it really stressed finances and people's temperament. So it's all COVID's fault because people are at a short tether and don't have any money. Therefore, he's doing the gentlemanly thing and stepping aside. Well, that'll save some face for him. But man, this is... If God had up. to use COVID to get rid of a bad bishop, uh, I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. don't, don't Why not? <laughs> George. Story number three is a good news story. What's that? Forward is that in Cuba? Faith. No, Forward in Faith. Oh, Forward in Faith. <laughs> Eric Meniz, Bishop of uh, San Joaquin in uh, California, has been elected the new leader of Forward in Faith North America. Mm. Forward in Faith has had an up and down history. It was one of the powerhouses when I started in this business 30 years ago, 25 years ago. 
but it has lost influence and it certainly doesn't have the money or reach that it once had. Mm -hmm. And Kevin, they haven't asked you to film their conferences for years, have they? Well, I mean, I think they don't have the budget for it. You, to, to have Anglican TV come, you pay the plane ticket, you pay an honorarium, uh, and you, you got to feed me. And at some point, they're just like, where's the balance? <laughs> where's the justification for all that money? And so now I've, I've not recorded, I think, the last two or three Forward and Faith uh, North America versions. Now, Forward and Faith is, it's not just North America, George. Well, they're, this branch. This Eric, branch is. But Eric it's, Manee, it's but it's an or, international, yeah, yeah, yeah. global organization. Mm -hmm. The UK, Australia, I think South Africa, maybe I'm not certain, but certainly it's global. Canada. Well, Eric Benice is one of the more, he's a great guy, mm -hmm. but in terms of competency in the Episcopal office, he's one of the bright shining stars of the ACMA. Yes, he is. I'll give you an example. He had an abuse crisis uh, two years ago, three years, before COVID, of a bad priest who was doing uh, hinky things with uh, men. And Eric Manise handled this by the book such that everybody of whom I'm aware saw this was done fairly, quickly, and properly. Um, it, I'm really excited that Forward and Faith may have found a leader who could bring it into the next uh, phase of its life. This is a good guy in terms of talent and as a person, and I... I'm hopeful that Ford and Faith can afford to bring you out next oh, year, yeah. Kevin, because they're full of new members, full of vigor, and they've got great nice. plans, and they want the world to hear it, so they're going to call Kevin out to film. I like Ford and Faith a lot, and uh, I think it was five years ago I was at a conference, and then they said, we don't want to be single issue anymore. You know, we, we want to expand what Forward and Faith and uh, envisions. Uh, we want to help uh, ACNA through the future uh, as it grows. And, you know, I like what uh, Forward and Faith puts in, on paper and the individual they have running it. And uh, I have nothing but uh, hope for Forward and Faith. All right. That's good news stories. Good news, good news, good news, good news. Well, I think we cover ourselves for five or six episodes. So maybe we don't have to do the good news next week, but we will. Anyway. Well, but Kevin, let's go out of order because we do have another good news if we want to stay on the good news track. Okay. What do you got? Which one? The presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, Michael Curry, Ooh, and funny. Griselda Delgado, Car Griselda Delgado Del Carpio, yes. the Episcopal Bishop of Cuba, and Joe Biden have all come out and denounced communism well, as a failed and, system. And, and Trump. And everybody has denounced communism. Yay! Finally. <sighs> An Episcopal presiding bishop has denounced communism. One of my favorite photos of all times is Frank Griswold embracing Fidel Castro. Right. It is such a wonderful photo of the Episcopal Church's political leadings, you know. And now, uh, presiding bishop Michael Curry, in response to the uh, massive social unrest in Cuba, uh, has uh, come out and supported the Cuban people. And Joe Biden, his press secretary said, well, this is all a response. They're all people are demanding action on COVID. Well, Joe Biden got some smart people in his office and he put out a statement uh, Tuesday night, uh, Tuesday, saying, no, the Cuban people want and deserve liberty. Uh, so yeah, he, he, he got was, the message. That, well, that was after they did their internal polling. What yes. do the American people <laughs> want me to say? And there are enough American people out there that want him to say communism is evil in a broken, bad system uh, that he had to say it. Yeah, they were fighting tooth and nail. The White House press secretary would not say it. She was being even asked by the liberal reporters, well, isn't aren't they fleeing co uh, evil communism? Oh, no, no, no. They're having health care issues. <laughs> They're having COVID <laughs> issues. The, the Cuban Episcopal Church is a funny church mm -hmm. in the sense that you can't sort of typecast it. It's really split in two. Uh, it was part of the Episcopal Church until it was pulled out basically on the orders of Castro because, you know, the embargo and mm -hmm. this and that. And it was semi-independent with under the oversight of the presiding bishop and the Canadian uh, 
uh, archbishop. And at one point, they had two bishops. One, uh, and they'd say, okay, well, Eastern Cuba, Western Cuba. And basically, one was a pro, pro Castro and anti Castro. For a while, they had a woman bishop in Cuba uh, who was had been in her earlier life a block leader of the Cuban Party's, uh, Cuban Communist Party's watch group. In Cuba, the Communist Party controls the population by having what we would call, uh, uh, what's that, community watch. I mean, the people who basically spy on their neighbors. But in the United States, it's parking on my grass and (laughs) or or leaving your trash out uh, too early the night before. In Cuba, it's making sure that, you know, these people report to the state and follow the guidelines of the party. They're informers. And the bishop and the Cuban Episcopal bishop at the, at one, who had been a leader in that movement. Okay, the, and finally they resolved the split because they couldn't elect a bishop because you had the two sides. And so finally under Catherine Jefford Shorey, uh, both people were co- uh, sort of basically convinced to retire at the same time. And Catherine Jefford Shorey held an essay contest. And she picked the winner, which was Griselda, who's actually Bolivian, who moved to Cuba after marrying a Cuban man. And so Griselda, the Bolivian Cuban bishop, has been bishop for, for years and for a few years now since Catherine Jefford Shorey. And she's sort of been neither fish nor fowl. She's tried to walk the line between the two wings, the pro-communist and anti-communist Cuban Episcopal Church. And now she's, uh, I guess, has the freedom to say, liberty is good. Yeah, and... <sighs> and folks, you're not going to hear this anywhere else but at Anglican Unscripted. That's right. <laughs> Communism is so bad, everybody has to agree. Except Castro, he thinks it's good. He loved that. You know, hey, Raul's still around, but he's not president anymore, but he's still the force behind everything. Well, in terms of Cuba, you know, is this another Arab Spring? Are we going to see this, you know, translate into other, and there's not a lot left, uh, communist countries? Or is this something that's a, a one and done just because Cuba is sick and tired of uh, six decades of repression? Has the embargo helped or hurt this? Uh, if you le- listen to Cortez, you know, this is America's fault that the people are re- rebelling down in... Uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you're saying. I can't just say Cortez? <laughs> no, because I'm thinking of Hernando Cortez, it's who right. conquered Mexico uh, <laughs> and Peru, or Peru, I forget which. You know, oh, I thought she was notorious enough that I could, just, or infamous enough that I could just say Cortez. My fault. So, uh, let's, you know, let's pray for Cuba. Um, hopefully this is the uh, Cuban summer where they can uh, finally rid themselves of just the despots that are in control there and uh, return to liberty. It used to be a very free place. A us. little too free. A little too free, yes, a little too free. <laughs> hey. Okay, um, boy. Now is a less than good story. Although it could turn into a good story. It's a redeemable story we're going to talk about. Uh, there is something called the ACNA2 uh, Acne 2 uh, is a Twitter uh, hashtag out there that is dealing with and covering and reacting to the sexual allegations and uh, kind of the whole happenings this last couple of years in the Diocese of the Upper Midwest. And they're making demands. And they put letters out. And I think George and I, as reporters, need to respond to this. Because what we do when we look at the upper, the diocese of the upper Midwest, what a long name for a diocese. They didn't follow the system and it went haywire. The system is there to be sure that this stuff doesn't happen. You take these steps, you uh, inform the authorities, you take these steps within the diocese, you do the, your investigation. And this is how we deal with this type of situation. When those steps aren't followed, chaos. And people complain and people are hurt and the church is divided and Christ is ill represented by his people and his church. The ACNA or ACTA 2, however you want to say it, 
um, want to be put in charge of this. They want to, hey, uh, we want to have oversight of what's going on here. And my first thing is, wait, but that's outside the process. We know that going outside the process is wrong and breaks things and doesn't help the system. Would putting ACNA2 help the situation to give them oversight, editorial control, access to the records of um, the staff in the diocese? And I don't think they have the background to be investigative in this in any way, shape, or form, it would hurt that system that we know works. And I know I'm going to make it a lot of people mad at me. And be mad at me, not George. Okay. George agrees with me, but please just be mad at me. I think ACNA2 is, is having any access or making any demands upon uh, Archbishop Foley uh, or the situation at hand is just going to make it worse. Sorry. Oh, ah. But you're a man and you're white. I know. It makes it worse. <sighs> George, did I miss anything? Apart from the fact that you're completely right, not at all. <laughs> okay. Ouch. I'm sorry. But it, I've talked about this since day one of Anglican and Unscripted going back 10 years. Coming up on our 10th anniversary here in 10 days. Uh, this is part of the pendulum. Okay, in politics, we see the left-right pendulum. Uh, we see reaction, overreaction. Event, over-event. What, what did we do wrong? What are we going to do really, really wrong? And in this pendulum, um, I see the ACNA2 here is kind of being an overreaction to a bad situation and not a fix to a bad situation. And I always believe... You stick to the process. Just saying. Let me let me lay out the facts as we know them, and as I say, as we know them, uh, as publicly been, available. That's what's been made publicly available. A lay uh, catechist by the name of Rivera at uh, Christ Our Light Anglican Church, a, a mission chant church of the Diocese of the Upper Midwest, is accused credibly accused of sexual misconduct uh, with women and with some children for and our he, lawyers we have to say allegedly allegedly mm -hmm. and but it is credible in that he has been arrested by the police sure. and is currently out on bail awaiting trial mm -hmm. it is alleged that the pastor or the vicar at this parish did not act according to the guidelines or norms of the ACNA in dealing with abuse the process and the process and then is it alleged that the staff at the diocesan level though initially sympathetic and supportive in their investigations did not do the job that the victims felt they should have done and then it is alleged that bishop Stuart rock did not give adequate supervision to the parish priest to his staff so this all blew up and bishop rock uh, earlier this week, released a letter saying he was going to step aside uh, pending an, a third-party investigation into the whole issue. And I think it was a, a wise choice because it, it took, uh, basically, let's play it out and play it straight. Uh, yesterday, uh, this group, ACNA, hashtag ACNA2, who had been uh, publicizing some of the allegations of abuse, released an open letter to Archbishop Foley Beach. In this open letter, they it's 13 pages, and you can find it on the website of Anglican Inc. Uh, they basically made a series of demands. And the demands were, and I'm going to boil it all down to its essence, that some staffers at the diocesan office be placed on leave, that Stuart Ruck be fired, that uh, they have access to the personnel files and uh, clergy disciplinary records of uh, the pastor of Christ Our Light Anglican Church, that before an investigative team is formed, they be given veto power over who are its members, and that when the final report is written, they be given editorial control of the report. So essentially, they wish to be the victim the prosecutor, the, the jury, and the judge. And they've 
like the Red Queen and Alice in Wonderland, you know, verdict first, trial afterwards. As Kevin pointed out, this is not the way the ACNA system works. And if you screw things up the first time by not following the system, you will only make it worse by following uh, the system of uh, people who are pushing themselves forward, claiming the right and the authority to do this. Um, I have sympathy for the victims of sexual abuse. I have fought for them all throughout my ministry. Mm -hmm. However, I do not have sympathy for cancel culture, where an allegation is sufficient to destroy the life or career of somebody. I believe in fair play. I believe in due process. And yes, it is more emotionally satisfying to shoot the people you dislike immediately and then prove that you had a right to shoot them. But we need to follow the rules here. Now, Foley Beach has tweeted in response that he's going to look into this. And part of the demands were that of this group were that the diocesan council be dissolved and the interim bishop be, uh, be of their choosing. Well, independent of this, the Diocese of the Upper Midwest released, a, 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 wrote to its clergy. Today's Friday was Wednesday, I think they wrote to their clergy, mm -hmm. or Thursday, Wednesday, whatever. Yeah. Wednesday, saying that uh, because several of the deans are uh, members of staff as well, uh, we're going. Uh, they have stepped. As they have going. They have resigned their position from diocesan council. So we need to elect a new diocesan council. And we had one lay member who has to leave for other reasons. So we're going to have new elections and we're going to have this group basically be the ecclesiastical authority under the ACNA canons and constitution until this is all resolved and Bishop Rook can either come back or we have something else happen. So the upper Midwest is following, playing it by the book, you know, in its internal deliberations, but this is not good enough. Uh, ACNA 2 wants oversight. They may call it input, but when you get the right to correct misstatements of fact in the final report, as they call it, you're given the right uh, to, to control the outcome. You're prosecutor, judge, jury, in addition to being victim. It's not fair. No, it, it doesn't. Two wrongs don't make a right. <laughs> You've heard it before. Mm -hmm. This would be a great example of that. Uh, in about three months, people will point to it. What were we thinking? You know, please stick to and, the process. And, uh, and 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 I have to admit that you know I get disturbed when I see. I understand how the news business works, and when I see stories coming out from certain quarters first, I either get in happy or sad, depending upon the author of the news art story, because I know these people, and this group has gone to the religion news service to be basically their breaking news source rns is very left wing it's very hard left yeah, has been for a long long time it's right there with ens it's it's left uh left. yeah i mean some people for me well it is it is no friend and certainly not an unbiased uh, source mm -hmm. it's 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 akin to leaking things to the Washington Post if you don't like Donald Trump or leaking things to Fox News if you don't like uh, Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. And having, starting out, if you read it from Fox News first, well, I'd also want to see what the left has to say. And if you read it in the Washington Post, well, I really want to find out what else people have to say because I frankly don't trust them uh, yeah. to be in, unbiased. No, absolutely. And, Kevin and I have our biases We're very straightforward for, with them on this show, but with Anglican Inc., we try to be, even to the extent of being boring, not to be, uh, to tilt things. We post Michael Curry's press statements, and they are at times dry. For a, a vivid speaker, he can write dryly. But we'll do that because we want to be fair. We want to be honest. See, the school of journalism Kevin and I come out of is that you're smart enough to make up your own mind. We'll give you the facts and you, based on your intelligence and life experiences, you make of it what you will. Um, you don't need us to tell you how to think. Mm -hmm. Frankly, I tried that with my kids and it didn't work <laughs> after the age of 12. Different. Why should no. I try it with you, you guys? <laughs> it doesn't work. Uh, 
Yeah, I so mean... rem- understand that games are being played here. Uh, that this is just a bad way forward. If you want a fair and truthful and godly outcome, if you want revenge, if you want punishment, if you want humiliation, this is a smart way to do it. If you want to divide and break down the church, you're doing a wonderful job. If you're looking to heal a situation, this is not the way forward. Let the process work. If you find fault with the process, please send me an email where the process is wrong. Uh, we can have, or put in the comments. Go into the comment section of Anglican Unscripted of this episode and tell me where the process is wrong because the process was not followed and we have a tremendous mess in the ACNA. And here's how Satan works. I want to step back a couple of months ago, was it was January, that uh, Bishop Rock put together this wonderful statement on behalf of the College of Bishops on how we are going to deal with those who have same sex attractions and what they want to identify themselves with, the hyphenation. And it was just an amazing document. Everybody praised it. It made the presses almost around the world. And Satan's like, well, <laughs> I can I can I can deflate this real quick because somebody well, wasn't following the process. Boom. Let's sh- let's shoot the messenger. Let's shoot sh- the messenger. So, shoot the messenger. You know, he 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 he's up. And I made a silly joke that the the, pic, the handout photo of him, he looks like he's a member of Herman and the Hermits, oh, sort of the seventies, you know, seventies <laughs> type uh, priest. It it look it's a priest, it's, it's a, a bishop's uh, vest, vest, but yeah. without a jacket, he sort of looks like he should have some beads and a tambourine, yeah. uh, and we go from that high mm-hmm. to this low. Yeah. Uh, Satan is at work. Mm. So. Yep, there's that. George, let's move on to the news real quick. Um, COVID's back. It's back in the news. The Delta variant is taking out um, uh, certain communities that haven't been vaccinated, uh, mostly uh, I read in L.A., uh, mandatory mask indoor this week. Uh, Sydney is back in lockdown. Uganda is having a, a lockdown again. Um, people, There's a guy last week who got Delta and he had been vaccinated and he had to have a, have a double lung transplant. I mean, it just, you know, when is this going to be over? I thought we had the all clear. I thought this current uh, vaccine was going to solve all our issues. And there's just breakouts around the country. And, you know, we need to, as reporters, talk about how it affects the church. Yeah, the city of Los Angeles County has a introduced an indoor mask requirement for public areas even though there's they've not offered any scientific evidence to this effect that it is necessary they even if you're vaccinated you need to have a mask indoors and in california it's children when they return to school in the fall must wear masks which and the reason and here's the the silly thing why what was their argumentation the department of education they did not want children who had been vaccinated to pick on children who had not been vaccinated because non-vaccinated children would have to wear a mask. Unvaccinated children wouldn't have to wear a mask. And they felt for social cohesion, everybody should wear a mask. Well, hold on. We're, we're currently living through the bully culture of the left. Now we don't want to bully those who've not been vaccinated? I don't know, George, that's weird. And it's, we have uh, we have uh, we've printed some stories by Russell Powell of Sydney Anglicans about the situation in Sydney. The government there has locked things down. Frankly, I don't think they've got a, Australia is becoming a lot more like Canada. Really weird uh, in their government. Uh, we wish Trudeau on nobody else but the poor Canadians. But they really don't have that bad of an outbreak in Sydney. But they're gone so far overboard. One of our commenters on the one of the prior episodes said they're not allowed out of the house except to go shopping and that's only once a day and it's one person um it's a real really hard response and then in uganda where they've got another wave the government has uh shut that it's a middle of a 42-day shutdown and they in uganda they do have people dying unlike sydney uh, the Diocese of Bristol, England, sent them a grant of money, the Church of Uganda, 
So the Church of Uganda could buy food for its clergy and distribute to the clergy because things are that difficult. Uh, it's really quite quite a diff- difficult situation in certain places. Just and Kevin, you, you being a new Floridian, I being a longtime Floridian, it's like we're living on different planets. No, we are. Um, uh, I, we got a press release from uh, Family Voice Australia. I was going to read it. Um, there's, I don't remember the organization, but there's the Albany Entertainment Center, which is... Uh, Anglican of, Christian League, uh, Australian Christian League, ACL. Uh, yeah. Uh, they wanted to rent out a theater, uh, partly uh, overseen by the government. The government now has a policy that affects Christians, uh, a policy that states the government-owned venues will not accept individuals or organizations where the content of the event does not represent the views of the Western Australian government or the vast majority of Western Australians. What? <laughs> so basically, if you don't believe in Christ, I can't rent your uh, event venue. Uh, you don't believe in uh, the sanctity of marriage or life or anything like that. I'm not allowed to uh, rent your event venue. No, it goes further than that. If they're allowed to get away with this, George, you know, Kevin, you've been a Christian a long time. I don't think you should have access to your pension and your Social Security. You know, wh- where do we stop? When, when does this Well, end? This, this is an old and tried formula, and it works. Yeah. For those with a historical memory, the United States before the Second World War, we had the German-American Bund, the American Nazis. And they sort of culminated, I think it was 36 or 37 or 38, with a rally at Madison Square Garden 38. where all the American Nazis came. Yeah. Well, you can't, under American laws, we have freedom of speech, freedom of conscience. You cannot criminalize the American, the German-American Bund. But what the venue owners did the people who own madison square garden and the theater owners and they basically put them on their blacklist so nobody would rent a space to the german american bund and before social media and you know and 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 the radio state network at the time which basically nbc and cbs and uh, uh, somebody else i don't think abc was out yet they would not cover these events it's what cnn does they want to make things go away and so what's happened is that an unpopular political view, and in this case, the German-American Bund, I think should have been banned. Yes. <laughs> they they shut them down through, through preventing them from having uh, venues. They refused to carry their, their speeches or stories or claims in the mainstream media, and it's all perfectly legal. And certainly when uh, japan attacked pearl harbor the german american bone was dead when hitler declared war on america but that's how you kill off and de- delegitimize uh speech you disagree with but that by was isolating done, that, it that and closing that it was away. done on the private sector not the government sector right right okay. see uh, that couldn't happen here yeah. in the united states but i think you we, we the Americans, sort of assume that the world is like us and our worldview and our values and our laws, and it's not. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Billy Graham organization was refused venues in the UK, in Scotland, yeah. because the the Billy Graham organization holds a traditional view on human sexuality, and the Scottish government thinks that's evil, so they refuse to allow a venue. Um, but that's the government. The United States is only private parties can do that, because if the U.S. government did that. It's impossible. Well, up to a point. You can deny a Christian, but you cannot deny a person who wants to buy a gay wedding cake. You know, it, 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 I mean, there, there, there is a little bit of hypocrisy right now at this time over that issue, but we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, George, we have hit 40 minutes or so. With the light, I can't really see the clock, but uh, we should hang it up for Friday. It's been a wonderful show. I can't, we got all the show. Just, friends, just just think what you'll get when you watch Anglican Unscripted. You get stories about American Nazis, how the current Bishop of Cuba got her job, uh, you know, the details of what's happening in the Anglican Church in North America. You're not going to get this anyplace else. If you want to hear this stuff, who knows? Maybe you don't want to know about American Nazis and Cuban bishops. No, you do. You do. This may be the first episode in many 
where we haven't talked about critical race theory. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you have been, can we call people you anymore? Or they, they, they have, they, yeah. they have been watching episode 674 of Anglican Unscripted.